Please stand. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. Please open your Psalter hymnals to number 72A. O God, your judgments give the king, number 72A.
God and Father in deed and obedience to the psalm, we come to exalt you. We exalt you as the true and the living God, the God who is most holy and most righteous, the God who is most merciful and gracious, the God who is most wise and powerful. Indeed, you transcend all that you have made. And yet you dwell with those who are humble of heart. And this you have demonstrated supremely in the sending of your son and in his humbling himself by taking our nature upon himself and in his giving of himself in that nature unto death and in his winning for himself a people for the forgiveness of their sins and for their life everlasting. And Father, we confess it by nature that we once were not a people, but now through Christ we are a people of God that come to praise the excellencies of our God. And so we ask now, O God, that you would come, that you would lift up our hearts by your spirit, that you would fill our hearts by your truth, that you would bless our lives by your gracious presence, even as we ask that you to do this in this hour. For all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So if you'll turn in the back of your Psalter hymnal, page 882. I'm going to read the questions for Lord's Day 24. So that is questions 62, 63, and 64. Again, we're on page 882. Questions 62, 63, 64. I'll read the question, and all of us will answer. Why can't our good works be our righteousness before God, or at least a part of our righteousness? Because the righteousness which can pass God's judgment must be entirely perfect and must in every way measure up to the divine law. But even our best works in this life are all imperfect and stained with sin. How can our good works be said to merit nothing when God promises to reward them in this life and the next? This reward is not merited. It is a gift of grace. But doesn't this teaching make people indifferent and wicked? No, it is impossible for those grafted into Christ by true faith not to produce fruits of gratitude. Before we go to the Lord in, in prayer, we can take your, your prayer request now. Jason. I want to thank everybody who prayed for me for my thesis defense. Uh, I appreciate prayer. They kind of put me back to work for the next year to do some major revisions. So prayer for steadfastness and encouragement, that would be appreciated. Parents would like to move down from Orange County to San Diego to be closer to us and their grandchildren. We need to help them find a place to live. Start from the beginning again. <coughs> my Sorry. parents would Your like parents. to move. My parents would like <laughs> would like to move down from Orange County here to San Diego to be closer to us and their grandchildren. And we need to help them find a place to live. Affordable. <laughs> Great for affordable. But well, now you're asking for a miracle. <laughs> in the right place. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Well, what is it? Uh, pray for the strengthening of the Johnson household faith. We just need encouragement and strengthening of our faith with how to deal with just life and our kids. I appreciate the prayer for my sister Denise. We were able to see her for Thanksgiving. That was nice. The first time she's seen our little kids since we moved here. She's not really well. She's bed bound, declining. It's kind of sobering to see her 
and the shape that she was in. But just a real praise. She became a member of the OPC there in Corona a few months ago, and they have just done such a wonderful job in caring for her. It really just speaks well to the church, to the pastor, to their deacons on loan there. So we're, we're grateful for that as well. Let's pray, shall we? A gracious God and Father, as we open the Sermon on the Mount, our Savior addresses first the blessing that awaits those who are poor in spirit. He speaks to those, Father, who acknowledge that by nature we have nothing, that there is a, a moral impoverishment that attends being the children of Adam and Eve, that with respect to you and the great riches and the wealth of your holiness and of your majesty, your utter purity, that we cannot begin to compare ourselves unless we wish to do so to our ruin and our condemnation. And so this evening we begin where Christ begins in that sermon, we come confessing, Father, our great need and we praise you and we thank you for answering this need in the sending of your son. And this one who by nature is rich and yet became poor for our sake. So that we through his impoverishment, his humbling himself might become rich. We bless the name of Christ again this evening who stood in our stead. And this one who took our punishment upon himself uh, that he might win favor of God for us and that he might answer the wrath of God that was against us. And we come this evening, Father, not as strangers then, as children and as those who have been reborn, as those who have confessed Christ, those who love Christ, who seek to follow Christ, desire to be conformed to Christ, who seek him not only as Savior but as Lord, and who come to you every day in the name of Christ. And yet we still come in our neediness, not needing to be justified. We are justified, not needing to, to know that you love us. You have promised us that you love us. But we come in the neediness of our weakness, our frailty, our failures, true, but even our circumstances, our health, all these things speak of our weakness before you, our great God. And yet you are ever compassionate when you descended on the mountain and stood, as it were, next to, to Moses in the cloud, you proclaimed your name. You proclaimed yourself a God who is merciful, that is compassionate. God who is gracious. God who is slow to anger. Is so forbearing with his people. And a God who abounds. Who is teeming with love and faithfulness. And Father, these are the very things that we need. They are proven in the gospel. They are promised to us through your son that we continue to come to you in our need and such requests like these show this to be the case. We continue to pray for our sister Amanda who many days does feel her weakness. We only ask that you give her sufficient strength to lift her eyes to Christ and to find in him what she needs. We do ask for mercy to be extended to her that you would give her a measure of relief from the pain and also the spread of this disease that plagues her body. We pray for Robin, who has become weak again, who seems to be descending again in her health. We ask that you would strengthen her as well. We do pray for healing as always, but again, Father, we pray especially for her faith, that it would not fail, that she would continue to trust her despite the discouragement of this recent onset, even this afternoon. We pray for Denise, Eric's sister, as we have before, who is bedridden and find ourselves in, finds herself in a position where she can scarcely take care of herself for any need whatsoever, is completely dependent upon 
the goodness of others, including the church at Corona, and how grateful we are, Father, alongside Eric and Heather, to rejoice in the faithfulness of those saints there to care for our sister in Christ. But we do pray for her, Father, in her condition, and ask that you would be near to her as well. We ask that your mercy would find that the good application, as it always does from you, as you always, always work wisely, and according to the generous outpouring of your love, may this be visited upon our sister as well. We also uh, pray, Father, alongside uh, the Johnson family. First, as Ryan is concerned for his parents, as they seek to move to be closer to children and the grandchildren. What a good thing this is, Father. But how is it going to take place? And here we present this need to you, even as we remember when Mary came to the servants and said with regard to Jesus, simply do as he asks. And here, Father, we present the need to you and ask that Christ would do as he wishes, that he would utilize servants, circumstances, the situation, the prayers of the Johnson family to bring these grandparents and parents closer to family. We pray with them, too, with regard to their family. Many of us feel uh, the depth and the earnestness of this prayer request for ourselves and for our own families. And what a right request it is to ask for faith. We think of Peter. Uh, Christ told him that Satan wanted to sift him like wheat. But he said, but I'm praying for your faith, Peter, that it will not fail. We pray for the Johnson family. We pray for ourselves that our faith would not fail. That as we continue to cry out to you on behalf of our children, especially those that are wayward, or those that seem to be indifferent to your call, that you would help us to forbear as well. Help us to be patient and to continue to pursue these loved ones with our love, but also by prayer, to never tire like the widow that we read of in Scripture, who is persistent. Help us to persist in prayer, to know that you hear us, but to know that our faith is expressed chiefly in prayer, and to come to you with these requests. We pray also, Father, for our brother Jason, how discouraging this news must have been to him, that he must uh, go about these revisions. And so, Father, we pray uh, that he would not be discouraged and that he would uh, set his face towards uh, these, uh, these revisions, and that you would give him, as he has requested, perseverance of heart, and that he would do this amidst all of his busyness as our intern in this church, as he seeks to serve us and, his, and Caitlin and the children. We pray, Father, that you would help him to to find that time which is so precious and so hard to find that he could uh, set, his, uh, set his will to this important task. Oh, how we pray, Father, that he would be able to, to see the finish line and what he's dedicated himself to in these last several years. Help him in his scholarship and help him to be humble as he uh, receives his revisions, but help him to persevere as he's requested. Father, there are many other requests upon our hearts this evening. Some in this room are suffering secretly that no one knows the burdens that they carry, but you see these things. You are the God who sees the heart. And so we thank you, Father, that you see these things, and as we whisper them to you, we pray again, Father, that as we cast ourselves upon you and your goodness, in your, in your wisdom, in your timing, and the excellency of your providence, give us patience, but give us faith to see that there are many times you have answered our prayers, we simply wanted something else. But almost always you have something else for us than what we wanted. And through these things you teach us, you humble us, but you also encourage us to pray. And we thank you, Father, for all the good fruit, the fruit of righteousness that comes from these things. Only help us ever to look to Christ as we do in this worship service. All these things we give to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, uh, let's turn in our hymnal, Psalter hymnal, to number 376. The head that once was crowned with thorns will remain seated as we sing this, number 376.
evening we return to the book of Esther, and we're going to begin at Esther chapter 5, verse 9, through chapter 7, verse 10. Esther chapter 5, verse 9. So if you please rise. Esther 5, 9. And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Then Haman said, Even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast she prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. Yet all this is worth nothing to me, so long as I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows fifty cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. On that night, the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bithana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. And the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials, let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square <clears throat> of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zerah said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther, and on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. What is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? Who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe, an enemy. 
this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, again, we come to sit under your word and its teaching, its truth, and its significance for us as your people and we know, Father, there are things that you have determined for us not just to hear this evening, but to believe and to do. And so we ask that you would teach us as only you can by your spirit and enable us, Father, to hear all that you have for us, that we truly might be conformed to Christ, that we might truly have the mindset of Christ, that we might follow the pattern of Christ. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. One of the things that, me, that uh, makes reading stories or watching movies interesting is to think about what is the arc of the story. And there are supposedly six different story arcs. I'm not going to describe them to you this evening. This is not a literature class, even though it's going to feel like it for the next few moments. Uh, but probably perhaps one of the most classic ones is Rags to, to Riches. This is where somebody starts at the very bottom. And the main character is just rising and rising and rising throughout the story. If you're a Jane Austen fan, Pride and Prejudice uh, follows this arc with some of the characters. Um, some of you read the, the book Holes or The Big Friendly Giant. You know, these stories follow that. My Fair Lady, if you know that movie, that's really dating you. And then and Les Miserables, uh, the main character, Jean Valjean, is truly a character whose arc is, is from rags uh, to riches. But then you also see the opposite as somebody who starts at the very top. And life is good, but the main character or a significant character continues to fall, to descend uh, throughout the story. Animal Farm uh, is a book where you see this uh, catcher in the rye, uh, easily the worst book I've ever read. And, um, and The Great Gatsby, some consider the greatest American novel. That's certainly an arguable point. But the main characters start as quite significant and they fall off. But there's a different story arc that's quite interesting. It's called The Man in the Hole, or what we would call the reversal of fortune. And we have something like that in, in our scriptural text this evening, where those that, who humble themselves are exalted, and there are those that exalt themselves, but by the end of the story are humbled. The Hobbit by Tolkien, of course, is a very good example of this. Disney films like Finding Nemo, Monsters, Inc., and then, of course, a great and very popular story, Raiders of the Lost Ark, if you will not mind the pun. Arcs are not just found in stories, they're found in life. And those arcs are the most significant patterns that we could trace in our lives. Each of our lives in this room tells a story. It has a pattern. And it's a pattern that either leads to life or death based upon where we stand with Christ. And we have places in scripture that, that illustrate this very idea so well, as is found in our text this evening. If you're taking notes, since I, I forgot to send those to Dee, uh, the first point is chapter five, verses nine through, through 14. Not enough, that's what we could call that, not enough. And then chapter six, reversal of fortune, Reverse of the fortune. Then chapter 7, those opening verses, pride goes before a fall. So not enough. That's the end part of chapter 5. Chapter 6, reverse of the fortune. Then chapter 7, 1 through 10, pride goes before a fall. Now, we've picked up right in the middle of the story. 
where Haman has just been to a banquet where he alone was invited to dine with the king and the queen at the queen's invitation. She wants to answer the king who's saying, what is your request? And she says, I want to have another feast, if you'll please come to that. That's, the, that's where we are in this. And Haman, we find out, has just left that first banquet, and his heart is full. It's filled with joy, thinks well of himself. And so what does he do? He gathers all of his friends and his wife Zeresh to do what? To talk about himself. It's something he does very well, comes naturally to him. He reminds them of his great wealth, which he's done before, reminds them of their many sons. Apparently his wife needs to know this news as well. And uh, of his prestigious place, all his promotions and all these things. But he leaves off of what just happened. He was invited to the queen's feast. He alone, I only, was invited to come with the king and the queen. And that is certainly something to brag about, but it kind of falls in with, with everything else. But he doesn't stop there. He says, but all of that's like nothing to me. Isn't it interesting? All my wealth, my power, are nothing because of that man, Mordecai, the Jew. All this is not enough for him. It's all because Mordecai is not intimidated by Haman. He's not intimidated by the one who authored this, this genocidal edict against all the Jewish people. He refuses to bow. He doesn't even stir, the text says, which suggests to us that, that Haman is not just irritated that um, Mordecai will not bow. He simply hates him. He resents him. And all this is more than Haman can take because it touches and what he loves most, himself, his fame, his status, his prestige. So Zeresh and his wife and his friends said, well, build a gallows and tell the king in the morning that to have Mordecai hanged on it. Haman likes this idea very much. It seems a little extreme, but he likes the idea, has it made immediately. And so Haman is going to go off to, in his sadistic joy to this feast. But he will not rest until this man Mordecai is dead. So, so far, it looks like the arc of Haman's life is on the rise. Meanwhile, and that's what it does, the story does it. It says, meanwhile, it's kind of interrupting. We want to know what's going to happen to this guy. But no, you need to know something very essential. Meanwhile, the king could not sleep. And so he has the royal chronicles brought out. So this is like an historic record of all the great deeds that have been done. And I think perhaps it reads about as interesting as the tax code. And it's, and it's, it's meant probably to get him back to sleep, right? Um, that's one interpretation. There are other possible explanations as well. And so one of his young men is reading, and as luck would have it, as luck would have it, happens upon Mordecai. And what happened and how he revealed that assassination plot against the king. What a coincidence that this would come up right here. And the king says, well, what honor has been paid to Mordecai? He's surprised at the answer, nothing's been done. Well, he needs to think upon this. And this is the king who always needs advice. And so he asks who's in the outer court, who's come into the court. He said, Haman has just entered. And Haman has summoned. He cannot believe his luck. He wanted to talk to the king and the king has invited him. He can't wait. He's got Mordecai upon his mind. And the king asks the question. It's almost like a riddle, the way he asks it. Look at it. What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? No name. Is it nameless? And then we're given a window into Haman's heart. Literally, it says he says in his heart. He's thinking. He's always thinking about himself. Who could the king want to honor more than me? Who but me could he have in mind? And you see that self-conceit of his, as somebody said, has found a foothold, and his presumption finds a voice. The voice I hear is Carly Simon, You're So Vain. Remember that song? <laughs> it's the last 70s music reference this evening, I promise you. But that's exactly his attitude, this vanity. Scripture says, out of the heart the mouth speaks, that's what we get. He, he has this idea. He says, let's put the king, king's robes on this man, Let's put the man on the king's, king's horse, on the head, a crown of that horse, and let's parade him around the city square. And then he says he's lying, and he savors this. This is for the man whom the king delights to honor. Those words are delicious in his mouth. He says them four times, because he's thinking of himself. The man whom the king delights to honor. 
This is amazing. This man already has the king's ring. Tremendous status. But he wants more. And all these things he's asked for show that he craves royal honor. All these symbols that speak of royalty, like the king's robes. Remember, Jonathan gave all of his, his robes and his armor. Uh, or Jonathan gave all of his armor to David. That was symbolic. But remember when, when Solomon was placed upon King David's mule. That was symbolic. These are all the symbols of royalty. This line, and have this proclaimed by a great official, such as done to the man whom the king delights to honor. He gets to say it again. Well, he thinks he's very clever. But his self-conceit has blinded him. It's blinded him. It will accomplish him nothing. And in fact, it will bury him. Everything he suffers from this point forward is self-inflicted. This is all because of him that he brings upon himself because of his pride and his arrogance. And so the king loves this idea, loves the idea. He says, go and do everything you said, leave nothing out and do it too. And you get to see Haman. He's just waiting to hear his name. And the king says to Mordecai the Jew, could you imagine his face? I mean, there's like three or four times in human history you would like to see somebody's face at that exact moment. This has got to be one of them. What a jolt that must have been. And so here he has to lead Mordecai around the city. He has to act as it were, like a herald for his arch enemy. This is done to the man whom the king delights to honor. You just wonder, he probably didn't put all of his zest into it that he thought he would hear of somebody else for him. And so Haman goes home, deprived of his glory, goes home with his head covered, that's significant, to mourn the death of his honor, as somebody has said. He tells his wife and his friends about this crushing defeat. Look at the phrase he uses in verse 13. He tells them, Everything that had happened to him, that is exactly the same phrase that Mordecai used in chapter 4, verse 7, when he was speaking to Hathak, the eunuch, about the edict he just heard. This is the phrase he used when he was at his lowest point. And here it's used again. Of this man who's at the top of his game, apparently, but maybe not. I think this is an omen. And so Zeresh and his friends who excel in the gift of comfort come to him and say, this is bad. This is bad. Look what they say. If Mordecai, who is Jewish, before he had begun to fall, that's the important word, then you will not prevail against him. You will fall before him. That word fall is the foreshadowing. It tells you everything you need to know of what's going to happen. Of course, they speak more than they know. This was true in the past. In, in the covenant God made with Abraham, he said, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. That's exactly what God promised. So they're speaking about the past, but they're also speaking about the, the future. But there's no time for him to reflect upon this. Look at it. It says he's hurried off to the feast. And what that shows is from this point forward, this man is always passive. He is completely swept up into Queen Esther's plan. This is the prime minister of Persia, and he is not in control. What a reversal. It's like the arc of Haman's life is now descending. As we come to chapter 7, the king and Haman join Esther for the feast. And following the feast, the king again renews his offer. This is the third time he has said this to the queen. He says, Queen Esther, what is your wish? It will be granted. What is your request? It will be fulfilled. And so as we don't lose ourselves in the whole response, what we need to notice most of all is Esther's response and what she does. She pleads for her life and for the life of her people. She links these two things together. They are now in an inseparable relationship from this point forward in the book. This Queen Esther and her people. Esther and the Jewish people. They go together. And she brings them together. And she pleads for them. She says, and look at her deference and her respect. If I have found favor, if it pleases the king, then here's my wish. My wish is that you would spare my life. Here is my request. You spare the life of my people. Haman always spoke to the king with conceit, with, with eagerness, suspicious eagerness. She speaks with deference and with patience. And she moves on. She says, we... I and my people have been sold. Now, sold has a, has a double meaning here. 
And so she explains it. She says, I don't mean for slavery. If that were the case, I wouldn't even bring it up because I wouldn't trouble you about something so trivial, about the suffering of me and my people that would come at the expense of, of your financial loss. That's not what I'm talking about. She says, we have been sold for destruction. Then notice the phrase that she uses here, to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. Now, there's no way you could remember what that comes from because we haven't been to the book of Esther for over two months. It's in chapter 3, verse 13. It's the very wording of the edict, of the decree against the Jewish people. She takes this very language. She's quoting, quoting this edict. But again, she's brought together her life and the life of the people. If they die, I die. These two things go together. But you noticed, have you noticed something? She still has not named her enemy. Whoever this is, she has left it nameless. That's exactly what Haman did. When he came and he made his pitch to the king, we should get rid of these people. They're terrible. They're working against the kingdom. He never named who they were. She's doing exactly the same thing. What's most interesting of all is the king still hasn't figured out who it is. But the way that Esther has presented it, it only stokes his anger against this invisible enemy. And so the king's response is given to us in these really cryptic little comments that show his anger. Like, like who is it? Where is this person? Who dares do this? That something would, it's a way somebody would express their anger. And it's at that point that Esther springs her trap. It's a dangerous enemy. It's this evil man, Haman. Maybe we'd like to see Haman's face at this moment when he realizes what has happened. He realizes now that Queen Esther is, as somebody said, the prosecutor. And she's made her case. The evidence is inarguable. It's clear. But the king is her judge. The king is his judge. The king and the queen are on one side. Haman is on the other side, terrified as he should be. We read here the king leaves the room in, in anger. And we have to appreciate the king is now in a jam. He's just heard what Queen Esther said. That's one side of this. But you see, the other side is the, is the laws of the, of the Medes and the Persians. They cannot be overturned. These two things are in exact conflict with each other. That's, that's the problem that's confronting him. But he's angry. Well, Haman stayed behind pleading for his life, and we would understand why anybody would do that. It was a huge mistake. The big mistake. When the king left the room, Haman should have left the room as well. According to royal protocol, only the king can be alone with any member of the harem, especially the king. There should always be at least seven steps between the queen and, and an official like this. Instead of leaving the room, what does he do? He falls. There's the word again. He falls on the couch of Queen Esther, begging for his life, but really sealing his death. The irony of this. He wants all these people to bow before him. Here he is bowing before Queen Esther. And again, as luck would have it, the king enters the room at this very moment, and this makes the king's decision easy. Look what he says. Will he assault the queen before my eyes in my own house? That's not really what's going on. He knows that it's not a real threat. There's great, gross impropriety here. And he understands what, what is, is happening here, to be sure. But to say this, this is what seals the fate of Haman. It says that they covered his face. It takes us back to chapter 6, verse 12. He went home with his head covered. Here it is again, not just with shame. This is a condemned, condemned man. And just then, one of the eunuchs speaks up, one of the servants it says, moreover, Haman has prepared a tall gallows for Mordecai, the very man whose word has saved your life, king. Now, the fact that a servant like that would speak up like this, it says something probably about how all the servants felt about Haman as compared to how they felt about Queen Esther. And what we read in back to chapter two, remember this? It was this, something we draw attention to, drew attention to, is that Queen Esther was winning the favor of everybody, all the servants, The king says, hang Haman on it. And the, man's, the king's hot anger cools down. But you see what's happening to the arcs. They've, they've changed completely. Everything has been turned upside down in this sequence of events. Reversals of fortune are almost complete for at least a couple of the characters. Haman, who's the top at this very story, what has happened to him? He's lost everything. He's lost his honor, his position. He's about to lose his life and all of his property and his sons. 
everything he boasted in, everything that promoted him, everything that was to his glory and honor, it's all about to, to vanish. This enemy of the Jews who exalted himself has been cast down, has been humiliated and condemned. But look at Mordecai. You've probably forgotten where we were last time. Mordecai is in what? He's in sackcloth and ashes. Where is he now? Royal robes around him. Well, this is quite a reversal, isn't it? And Esther has just begun. Has just begun. It was our Lord who said in Matthew 23, verse 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Our God has very definite opinions about pride and self-conceit and arrogance. And the reason why is because pride loves to elevate itself above everything else to the point where eventually it, it becomes like a God. And it will sacrifice anything and everything that gets in his path, as we see in this story. But there's a problem with pride. And the book of Proverbs says that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's what we have recorded in this sequence of events this evening. Is it not a man who, is, who pictures perfectly someone who is full of, of pride and full of himself, whose pride actually has no bounds, his greed has no limits? A man who must be worshipped by everyone and cannot stand the fact that there's one man who refuses to bow down before him, but it's not enough. There's something manic about this man that because of this one man who wounded his pride, he wants to commit genocide against an entire race. This is, as we said before, demonic. And you see, it's a small picture of Satan. God created Lucifer as an angel that was magnificent in, in beauty and in power and in gifts. He was given so much, but it was not enough. He wanted more. More power, more honor. He wanted to be worshipped just like God. He does the most ridiculous thing, tempts Jesus in the wilderness. He says, bow down and worship me. We hear the voice of Haman in that, do we not? But Satan, who exalted himself in pride, his pride that went before his destruction, his haughty spirit went before his fall, just like Haman. This is an arc of riches to rags. We see it both in a fallen angel and we see it in this fallen official. And of course, the greatest reversal of fortune is seen in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This truly is humiliation that gives way to exaltation. When we think of just even the, the bare bones of the gospel in its smallest form, we marvel at the humiliation of the Son of God who, who made himself Nothing, the infinite condescension, the infinite descent of Christ taking our nature upon himself. As we think of it, that he who is Lord of all becomes a servant of all. He was the very form of God, becomes a form of a servant. And as we think of what Christ had to endure for our sakes, this greatest humiliation of death upon a cross, and that death and that humiliation had to come before his honor and before his exaltation. And what's interesting is we compare these these two different arcs, for Satan, pride comes before a fall. Why? Because Satan exalted himself above God. But for Christ, humility comes before honor. Because Christ humbled himself before God his Father and men. At the cross, Satan could not believe his luck. This grand opportunity finally to bury the Son of God. But it was a trap. It was a trap. Because even though Christ is suffering on the cross in agony for our sins, even though he is there uh, dying for us, even though he's there interceding for us into death through the cross, we read Christ won a great victory, disarming the rulers and the authorities. They're exposing them to open shame and bringing glory to God in this great triumph of his death and freeing us from our sins. This is the great reversal, though, is that Christ is raised. This one who was humbled unto the depths of the earth and buried under the earth is raised and ascended and is lifted to the right hand of majesty, and there he reigns as head over all things. There is nothing exempt from his sovereign rule. 
We read that all rule and authority and power and dominion are in submission to him, are literally under his feet. You see, this is what is done to the God-man whom the king delights to honor. But see, the question is this evening is what is the ark of your life? What is the pattern that your life is going to tell those who, who watch, those who see? And you see, despite all the blessings that we have in this life, all the things that are available to us in this life, our life's true ark is yet to be revealed. And there's this temptation of the world that says, you need to exalt yourself, you need to, to push you need to climb up. You need to climb over other people if it's necessary. You need to boast. You need to indulge. You need to hoard, hoard to yourself. You need to do whatever it takes to advance yourself. And this appeals to most people. But the question is, does that appeal to you? And the psalmist in Psalm 73 says, this almost happened to me. My foot almost slipped because I saw how everybody else was advancing. But Christ says, those that exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who seek their life will lose it. That is not the way of a Christian. And this evening I remind you again to hear the voice of Christ. And he says to you this. He says, follow me. Follow me. Take up your cross as I took up my cross. Deny yourself as I denied myself. Humble yourself as I humbled myself, and you will be exalted. This is the path that he has called each of us to walk in. This is what it says in 1 Peter 2. It says, if when you do good and suffer for it, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. You see, it's not just that we suffer for Christ in this life. We suffer like Christ, like him. We have to endure being ridiculed and many times being misunderstood and misrepresented, suffering all kinds of humiliations, being rejected, being insulted, uh, being slandered and trashed and abused, just like our Savior. Because our reward, our treasure, our glory is not on this earth. We're not looking for exaltation in this life. Our portion is not in this life. Our inheritance awaits us in the world to come and in the life to come. And so we are called to suffer all these things, but Paul reminds us in Romans 8 that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. That despite the descent of the ark in our lives, as we seek to follow Christ and walk in his steps, this does not compare to what comes on the other side of the ark as he lifts us up. Those that humble themselves will be exalted. And it's true, even in this life, the power of sin to, to condemn us and to, to rule us is conquered. But you and I are looking for the presence of sin to be gone. Already in this life, you and I have been adopted as God's children. No, we're looking for the fullness of our adoption, the full redemption of soul and body brought together in glory. In this life already, you and I enjoy new life and abundant life. But we will not be satisfied until we receive eternal life. And already we are loved in this world. But we're looking for a world of eternal love. A world without any disease or pain or illness or weakness or imperfection where there's no crying and no pain. Instead, a world of endless praise and beauty and glory where sinners like ourselves are made perfectly blessed in the full enjoying of God forever and ever. And his promise is this, such will be done for those whom the king delights to honor. For those who trust in Christ, for those who follow Christ, for those who long to be with Christ. Let us pray.
Our gracious God and Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for its simplicity, its clarity. We thank you, Father, for these saints that have gone before us and have shown us the way, but we thank you most of all for Christ. And we walk in his steps. We walk in his way, the way that he has modeled to us, the way that he has shown us, the way that he's called us to go in. And so, Father, this evening we commit ourselves again to him and ask for grace and faith that we would truly follow Christ. We thank you that you've granted to us all that we need to do so. We thank you for the very great and precious promises. We thank you for your presence of your spirit. We thank you for each other. But we thank you most of all for Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing song this evening is number 335, Praise the Savior, Now and Ever, number 335. Please stand. blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said. Amen.